and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena that I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap between fitness and wellness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences, all in an effort to help fitness and wellness professionals become a part of our healthcare continuum. And to do that in episode 44, I'm joined by Diane Boyce. Diane is from the Innovation Partnership Startup Incubator at the University of Michigan. And when you hear me say where she's working, you might wonder why she's on the Wellness Paradox podcast. And I think one of the great things the pandemic has shown our industry is that we need to look outside of ourselves for lessons to be successful. And we've seen that many, many different times over the course of the past couple of years. And Diane is going to give us a masterclass on not just networking and startup tips, but also some very actionable steps that current business owners or would-be business owners need to take to ensure that their business launches successfully and maintains that success. I think this conversation not only pertains to someone that's actually looking to start their own fitness center, gym, or boutique studio, but also to the solo fitness or wellness professional that's just running their own private business. Uh, The lessons that are taught in this podcast are, are very agnostic in terms of the actual outcome. And I think you're really going to enjoy Diane's unique perspective, not only on the startup world, but also on our industry. And she gives a lot of very helpful and salient examples. Any information that we'd like to share from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode four, four. Please enjoy this conversation with Diane Boyce. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Diane Boyce. Diane, thank you so much for joining us today. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited about this conversation because at first glance, uh, your background may seem like a background that wouldn't be well suited for our type of podcast episode. But I think one thing that the fitness industry has learned, particularly throughout the course of the pandemic, is we need to take lessons from other industries and and other thought leaders from outside of our industry. And that's why I'm excited to have this conversation. We were connected by my good friend, Tom Rafai. And so a shout out to Tom for the connection, who was actually the first guest ever on the Wellness Paradox. So Tom, thank you for still contributing. But Diane, I want to dive in. Uh, Let's just, for a little more context, uh, tell us about your background. So I am a medical scientist by training, um, uh, cardiology and oncology, so molecular biologist, and then left academic science to go into business. And so I I usually say I'm bilingual Mm -hmm. uh, in science and business. And I've been in in business and helping commercialize science in one way or another for the last decade. I love it. And, And that is something that our field, quite frankly, needs. We need people that understand the science of what we do, but also understand the business end of it. And uh, you were at the University of Michigan in something that I had never heard of before prior to the connection with Tom, uh, which is the Innovation Partnerships Startup Incubator. Did I get that right? You did. And thanks. <laughs> tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit more about that. You know, what's its mission? Who does it serve? Yeah, so um, the Startup Incubator is part of Innovation Partnerships. And Innovation Partnerships is not um, widely known around the university community as such just yet, because we recently rebranded, I'm going to say three, four months ago, from the Office of Technology Transfer, some people call it OTT, to Innovation Partnerships. And that's in part um, people in technology transfer, people who work at large academic institutions and technology transfer know exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. But for 
everyday people, which is most of the population, technology transfer doesn't mean very much. And especially not everyone uh, at a university who invents something or discovers something or creates something, not all of that could be considered a technology. And so you might think um, you're not being served, but practically, your technology transfer office, whether it is at University of Michigan or elsewhere, if you're in academia or even if you're in, in, with a large company, if there is such a thing as a technology transfer office, they're there to serve you, help protect the intellectual property of what you might have invented or discovered, and then help you get it into the world. And so we really come from the place of not all researchers are also business people. Mm -hmm. That's fully understood. And so it takes different skill sets. And that's that's why, why our team is there to help. And so very specifically, because University of Michigan is such a powerhouse of research, um, it's a very large research, the largest public research university in the country. So we do get a lot of invention disclosures. People invent a lot of things across different industry sectors and research areas. And that means that um, my colleagues in licensing um, do a lot of patents and licensing. Mm -hmm. um, and that ends up with, uh, you know, 25 to 30 startups per year. And so I'm on the venture side. Um, I don't uh, work directly with, with an inventor in the early stages. I come in at the stage where it has already been decided we're going down the startup route. We're going to start a company and, and help get this uh, invention into the world. And um, so we're, we're a small but mighty ventures team aided by a group of industry professionals. So people have an understanding of the science, but more and a deeper understanding of the business who help shepherd. And um, usually when I meet new people, I say kind of tongue in cheek, my job is landlord and mother hen to 20 startups and a resource to another 150. And that's a lot of startups that have at some point spun out of the University of Michigan. The landlording part is what you alluded to. I run the Innovation Partnership Startup Incubator. It's a physical space where a startups that come out of the University of Michigan can rent um, lab space or office space. Uh, building a lab space in your garage is, 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 is really, really expensive and often simply not practical. So you need to find lab space you can rent. Um, and so that's the landlording part, but the mother henning part is helping the startup succeed by connecting them to what they need. And I, I do that and our team does that, connecting them to usually a combination of advice, talent, and money. Because every, every business, every startup, but every business in general needs some form of, of advice, talent, and money. And so that's a, that was a whole mouthful, but I hope that explains a little bit what I do and what we do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you landed right on the area that will transition us into our discussion here, which is you are, and I love the term mother henning. I, I, I could have used a mother hen when I first started my business, that's for sure. Uh, and what you do in your world, those principles are kind of agnostic to all types of startups. Yes, you work with specific startups, but we're in an industry right now where the, the power has essentially been taken back over by the individual professional. For many, many years, it was the big box gyms and the boutique studios. They held and consolidated most of the power. Now, because of the pandemic and all the virtual technologies that have spun out of it in our industry, you're now starting to see many fitness and wellness professionals starting their own businesses. And I'm sure many of our listeners have always had the dream to open their own gym or fitness studio. So in saying that, uh, I would like you to take your some of your best mother henning lessons and teach on that for a little bit. So I guess the specific question is, uh, it, what lessons have you learned in helping startups become successful that would be useful to our audience? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. And I think that if, if, uh, if I were to give you the shortest possible answer, and then I'm going to expound, um, it would be lean startup principles. And so um, it's, it's really a way of thinking about business and a way of um, 
figuring out what are the most important things that I need to check before I spend a whole lot of time and money on something. And so um, that can sound pretty jargony. Um, the Lean Startup is a book by Eric Ries that, that um, gained popularity over the last decade or so that um, I, I, I would recommend to a lot of business owners. But you don't, you know, the, really, the, if there's one thing I would say to take away from the conversation, it would be identify the riskiest part first mm. and test it as well as you can. So when I speak to scientists, I say, find the hypothesis, the, 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 the critical hypothesis first and test that hypothesis. Um, so I think, and in part, you can see, even I even tailor my language and it, as a function of who I'm speaking to. And that is something that um, applies to everything. I sometimes talk to people about how to use lean startup principles and apply them to your life, mm -hmm. to your career. Um, so this is not just something uh, for startups. And so drilling in a little bit, um, figure out the problem, the most interesting problem that you are trying to solve. Um, and given that we're we're talking a, a, about a, a constantly shifting ecosystem and constantly shifting um business landscape um especially in the light of the pandemic mm -hmm. um ask yourself am i still solving a problem that people have mm -hmm. and are there adjacent other problems that might be bigger that my skill set is equally apt at solving. And so pause every now and then, ask yourself whether you're, you're solving the right problem for the right people um, and, and drill a little bit deeper to figure out um, whether, there, whether there are different ways to adapt and solve a problem and then talk to people about it. The next step in, 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 the, in the lean startup world or framework is something that people call customer discovery. And um, to some extent, I've always said um, that's a little bit of a misnomer because it sounds like you're only talking to potential customers. Um, and there's the famous Henry Ford quote, if I had given the, uh, the, the customer what they wanted, it would have been a faster horse. And so that quote can get a little old, mm -hmm. especially in the innovation world, but it tells you Talk to potential customers, absolutely. And then talk to other people. And that's what you and I are actually doing today. Right. I am not a slam dunk type of person to bring onto, uh, onto a fitness and wellness podcast, but you're doing exactly that. You're going to the, the, the edges by inviting me to the, to, to the, to the fringe and uh, fringe in a positive sense, not in a negative sense, um, to fringe of the, the community to see, is there wisdom to be gained from people who are not exactly like me, but whose knowledge pertains somewhat to what I'm doing? Ask them questions, learn about their views and what the, how they can impact your hypotheses about what you think about what you do. Don't know if, if, if that's helpful, but I, I, I really do believe in get, casting a wide net for information, learning as much as you can, and then bringing it back down to, all right, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there are several things that struck me in there. First off, you know, what is what is the critical hypothesis? And I think you know, business owners and would-be business owners fail to be either disciplined enough or have the foresight enough to ask that question. They, they ask the question of, you know, what's the, the general thesis behind my business? But it's never what is what what's the rate limiting hypothesis to the success of this? And that I, and I'm curious to your thoughts. That probably takes a decent degree of discipline and critical thinking to get to. I would agree. And it changes. And so um, startups are often raising money. And so when I'm coaching a startup, I will often say, uh, answer in the way you talk to people, answer the question, why me? Why you in this case? What is so special about you? What do you bring to the table that you do better than other people? Um, and so, and and then 
what is different from your offering that other people are not doing. And I think that's, and, and that can shift, right? Um, it's, it's perfectly fine to do the same thing as the next guy. But um, if, if that is the case, then perhaps your differentiator is price. Whereas if you do something different, then you don't have to differentiate on price. You can differentiate on something else. Um, you know, in, in my case, I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant. If I were to start a business, I could say, I can do this in English, but I can do this in a, in a couple of other languages as well. And the next person might not be able to do that in those languages. So that's perhaps the piece that I bring to the table. Um, you know, uh, or there's, there's so many different things to pull at. So um, find what's unique about you. And still, I'm, I'm coming back to the find a really important problem to solve, not just I'm good at this, I'm just going to shove it at people. I'm just going to say, here, I am awesome at this, you must want this. <laughs> and we see that that's that's human nature, right? I'm good at this. Of course, I'm trying to sell it to you. But practically, I should be selling you what you want, not just what I think is awesome. Yeah, precisely. You said something there. And again, there's so much richness to what you're saying that I, I want to make sure I, I pull some things out. You talked about you know, competing on a, a unique differentiator, having sometimes we hear it referred to as a, you know, a unique value proposition or selling proposition. And you can compete on that or you can compete on price. And mm -hmm. we, we somewhat see that in our industry. And, and you're probably at least peripherally aware of this, the gyms like you know Planet Fitness and Crunch that charge $10 a month, you know, they are competing on price. And there's nothing right or wrong about that. It's just their competitive model. But from a, a broader perspective, the term that comes to my mind when I think of competing on price, and I'm just curious to get your opinion on it, do you feel like on some level that's a bit of a race to the bottom? It very well can be. Um, and, and so um, that depends on the business model. Mm -hmm. So um, if I am providing services one-on-one -on -one and I'm competing on price, my day only has 24 hours. And so I am not infinitely scalable. Now, if I, you know, we're talking on a podcast, if I record podcasts and I start char charging you money to listen to my podcast, that is potentially infinitely scalable. And so if I were to, you know, just for sake of example, charge a dollar per listen, that, that, that could be infinitely scalable, whereas my day still only has 24 hours. So if I do one-on-one -on -one coaching or training, how many hours can I train? So that then I need to understand that differentiating on price would lead to a race to the bottom. And there's also a signaling function of price. If I offer this in, in, in somebody's perception, the same thing as the next person, and I charge you half the price, is what I offer worth half of it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it, it, is, it is important that you think about that. And that is one of the hypotheses to test by asking people questions, not necessarily how much would you pay for this, but mm -hmm. asking what are the things that you do pay money for? How much do you pay for it? Um, how important is this in comparison? So, you know, do, do you have a, um, you know, a latte from your favorite coffee shop every day or every week? And so I can then approximate how much that type of beverage costs. And so how important is this to you? Is it as important or more important than that latte? Um, or, is it, or is it less important? Um, and so I can, I can approximate um, the frequency of use and, and, and the money people attribute to it. So without going too deep down the exact money rabbit hole, I think you need to test how much is it worth to some, to, to someone as well. And that comes straight back to talk to as many people as you can and get better at getting those answers. People don't like talking about money. And so you have to get creative in getting to the answer, sometimes by using workarounds, like using things that you know how much they cost. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you took that question exactly where I wanted it to is when you have infinite resources, Planet Fitness is a great example. They have you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of facilities around the globe, massive scale, massive square footage. Your, your scale is infinite, but hours in the day aren't. And I'm very glad that you mentioned that because I think that is, that's a great lesson for a lot of our solo fitness professionals and wellness professionals is that you have to find that unique differentiator because if it's just going to be on price, uh, eventually you're going to be pricing yourself right out of a job. Now, let's, let's go back to the, the customer discovery element to this, because I find this to be fascinating and underutilized at the same time. And let's talk about it in two different ways. I feel like a lot of people, particularly in our field, do what you said earlier. Hey, I love this. I'm passionate, at it, uh, passionate about it. I'm good at it. I'm going to go open up my business. I'm going to hang up my shingle and do my thing, which it works out sometimes and it doesn't other times. Talk about that kind of urgency to act and get something up and running before you've actually done the requisite homework to know what it needs to look like. That's a really tricky balance, right? Um, it is the um, keeping forward motion. So doing something rather than doing nothing mm -hmm. um, so that you don't... Um, have this analysis paralysis. We could we could we could talk and plan forever. Um, it, it's only real when you actually do something. Um, but then it's do the do the critical thing first. So do lightweight experiments. I'm going to say if if I were um, a, a fitness professional, which I'm not, um, so I'm making this up. Um, I could I could say. I'm really good at this in general. And so I'm going to serve all types of customers. Or I could say, I am particularly passionate or good at um, about helping women in their 60s who might have uh, stopped exercising, get back into exercising. So now I've gone from the world. I can train young people. I can train old people. I can train people who are in perfect health. I can train people who are in not so perfect health too. I picked a super slim sliver of the population that I'm going to focus on and that I'm going to specialize in. Now, does anybody actually care? Does anybody actually do this? Does anybody focus on women in their 60s um, to get back into exercise? And again, I'm pulling this out of thin air, but it, it, it you know, as an example, it, it, it might serve us for, for, for a little bit. Um, so then I can try and define, is this too wide or too narrow? Um, so talk to a couple of women in their 60s, mm -hmm. talk to a couple of women in their 70s, talk to talk to talk to to, to people of all ages, and then talk to a couple of fitness bloggers, talk to a couple of owners of gyms to see who are the people who come in, who are the people who come in once and then don't come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, read. Talk, talk, potentially talk to manufacturers of fitness equipment. Who are the people who buy that type of stuff for at home? Um, so those are the types of things that I would want to do before I settle on this particularly narrow segment. But if I learn through my conversations that that's an interesting segment, then I might lean in more and just do a pilot, you know, um, you can nowadays whip up a website relatively easily. There are services that help you do that if you don't have like the technical skill set to do that. Um, there's a startup in Ann Arbor that that will make a website for you, like and and just run it for a monthly fee. Happy to kind of point people in that direction. My job is to point people to resources, right? So you could say, all right, I want this website for three months, and I'm going to offer X, and then I'm going to see if people bite. I'm going to put some stuff out on social media, or I could just create a Facebook group and talk to people. So that's a small, low cost experiment. It costs me a little bit of my time. Maybe it costs me a, a little bit of money, depending on what I do. That's um, people sometimes call it a lemonade stand mm -hmm. um, because it, it shows you whether your lemonade is any good. Is anybody coming back to buy a second cup? And in this case, are, are customers interested in the thing that you're talking about? before you, you know, build a large business plan and things like that. It's a very lightweight hypothesis. Are, you know, is this customer segment that I'm targeting relevant? 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it's the concept from the, the software world of, of beta testing. You're basically building something light and agile and minimally capitally intensive and seeing if it works. And, and I can't tell you, Diane, how many friends and colleagues I have who have not taken that step, have gone out, signed a lease, bought a bunch of equipment, and then six months in, they realize that their business isn't viable, not because they're not good or not because they're not passionate about it. It's just because the market for any number of reasons wasn't the right fit for what they were looking to actually have as a business. I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you more about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for the fitness industry with upwards of one third of our clubs closing nationally on a permanent basis. One of the few stabilizing forces during this very tumultuous period of time has been URSA, the National Trade Association for the Health and Fitness Industry. On my crusade to make fitness professionals part of our healthcare continuum, the work that URSA is doing is absolutely vital. They provide advocacy and lobbying support at both the federal and the state level. They support state alliances in many ways, and they also provide resources and best practices to club owners, operators, and individual fitness professionals. Indeed, if we are truly going to become part of the healthcare continuum, we must speak with one unified voice, we must have best practices that we implement, and we must come together as an industry to ensure the public, the medical community, and lawmakers hear our message loud and clear that movement is medicine and it is essential. That is the work that URSA is doing. They've recently revamped their membership structure, allowing large clubs, small clubs, boutiques, and individual professionals to join the organization for an appropriate price that allows them to have access to all of these many great resources and allows us to unify and amplify our voice as an industry. For more information on the amazing work that URSA is doing, go to their website, ursa.org. That's I-H-R-S-A dot org. I-H-R-S-A dot org to look in a little bit further into the work URSA is doing to unify our industry, to move us closer to being a part of that healthcare continuum. Now back to today's episode. I'm curious about your perspective during the process of getting your head out of the business and up above the business to do that again. I feel like, and I, I say this as an entrepreneur myself, I started my business without actually answering a lot of those great questions that you, that you just posed. And so on some level, it's a miracle I'm here right now. But one thing that I didn't do until I felt it was too late myself, and I feel like this is going to resonate with a lot of our listeners, is I spent so much time working in the business that I didn't get up above the business to look out and around. So with that said, from your perspective, how often or how important is it, maybe both, how often and how important is it to actually do that? You certainly do that before you start, but in your experience, that should be a, a cyclical thing, I feel. So talk on that for a second. I appreciate that question. And I think it ties back to something that we briefly poked at earlier in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, that's uh, mentorship and accountability. Mm. Um, so if, yes, it would be really good if um, you pull up and away from the from the daily uh, um, activities. Just as a business owner, you're really busy. You're you're in in reaction mode. You're just reacting to what happens in the business. You're not in strategic mode. So, um, if the world were perfect, and if I were perfect, I would be able to remind myself to make that time and and think. But um, because not everybody's perfect, um, sometimes uh, enlisting either a friend, a colleague, or finding a mentor who basically is a forcing function. If I meet with you quarterly and we're going to talk about my business and we're going to talk about my plans for the next quarter, and it could be quarterly, you know, select your own timeline. Um, 
if we're going to talk about my plans and then we come back next quarter and I did exactly none of the things I said I was going to do, um, I will feel accountable. You don't even have to like frown at me and tell me, you know, it, this, it, I think that's the, that's the difference between um, business owners and entrepreneurs. You really don't owe anything to anyone, but the other person can help you be accountable for your growth plans. Um, you can make you can make your your quarterly, your annually, your five year plan, and then adjust it because the world changes. But I think that is that is really important. So I appreciate the question as to that balance of um, of just doing and really taking a step back and seeing how is my industry changing. If I keep doing this, well, will my business simply go away? How should I pivot? What what will be needed five years from now? And am I well positioned for that? Yeah, that, that, is, that is such a valuable answer to give. Finding the mentor, the coach, the accountability partner. In, in our field, we're, it's very a commonly used practice to suggest that a client would find an accountability partner, have it be their spouse or somebody at work, mm -hmm. just to make sure that, that they're on track with the things they're doing that's above and beyond the fitness professional that they're working with. Mm -hmm. This is you know, precisely the same thing. And I'm curious if you have any advice for the person that's sitting there listening to this going, yeah, man, like I could really use somebody like that. And let's assume, let's assume that they probably can't afford a formal coach or mentor. Uh, who's a good person to look for in their life to be that accountability partner? Really good question. And I tell people that, especially when I give people career advice, um, there's this concept of a personal board of directors. Mm. Um, so people who are perhaps not very close friends that you see all the time, but people that you have come across that you professionally respect that may not be in the exact same line of work, but that um, you have a professional and personal respect for and that you convene with every now and then. And so this could be a past colleague from, you know, two, three jobs ago, someone you met, maybe even someone you met in, in training, um, you know, when, when you were coming up to become the professional that you now are. And I, I think... Um, so many types of businesses are, are people businesses anyway. And so mm -hmm. I think the, the fitness and wellness area for sure is. Um, I would, of course, not recommend it be your clients. I would also not recommend it be your spouse or a family member, just because it brings the, the, the personal dynamics into the equation. I'd like to keep the business conversation on the business. And then we can talk about personal growth as well. My personal uh, life does play into my business. So it, it can be a, a, former, a former teacher, um, it, but a lot of um, economic development organizations also have mentors and residents on staff. And so um, pretty much regardless of where you are. So here in Michigan, we've got the MEDC, the Michigan Economic um, uh, development corporation and the and and nationally we have the SBDC the small business development corporation and they have the, the SBDC has chapters everywhere so find your local SBDC maybe there's a good business mentor there that you can run things by um, so there's so there's professional mentors um, that help small businesses and you are a small business regardless of whether you're a startup or you're a, a, a you know a, or a, a family business so there's professional help there but I also really believe in staying in touch with people you have come across and so um, different mentors for different phases of your life and different phases of your business and nobody says you can only have one and so cast a wider net, stay in touch with people who impress you, uh, whom you respect. And if you're respectful of their time, most people are willing to give back and willing to give you their time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's very interesting what's happened in our industry throughout the course of the pandemic. And this is something that will resonate with a lot of our listeners we used to view ourselves as highly competitive with one another. Like the gym down the street was your mortal enemy. Now we realize coming through the pandemic, the only way that we are going to get through this 
is to get through this together. And our real mortal enemy, at least in our industry, is the fast food restaurants and the couch and the remote control. And so I think now the time for that collaboration is right more so uh, than anything else. And I know I've experienced it personally. So I appreciate the perspective of, hey, you know, reach out to your colleagues. But I will say, you mentioned the MEDC. Uh, I've actually utilized them for a couple of things in my business. And I have been absolutely blown away by their level of service and their deliverables with no cost. And it, it is, it, well, it's not no cost. We all live in the state. We all pay our tax dollars and our tax dollars are going to fund that. Uh, that is such a valuable suggestion. And, and everything we're talking about, Lean Startup and MEDC and all these groups, we'll link up to in the show notes page. So all of our guests have a chance to, to take a look at them. But there are resources out there if you just take the time and put in the effort to look. Completely agree. And so finding, finding that, finding the, the right resources for you is so important. Let's move on to talk a little bit about funding, because I always feel like this is an interesting conversation. And realizing you don't have a ton of experience with the, the fitness and the wellness world, but you know enough about funding of startups to probably assume that we aren't necessarily the most widely funded businesses out there just based upon you know, low low collateralization in our business, uh, high risk of failure. There's banks don't tend to like fitness businesses a lot. And that was before the pandemic. But I'm curious from your perspective, because I'm sure you've looked at many creative funding vehicles over time for your ventures. What would you say to the fitness or wellness professional out there that's like, hey, I want to open up my own small studio and I need to go find money for this. Where can they go looking that's not under their mattress? <laughs> That's a really tricky question. Um, and you're right, um, especially for a one person business. Um, if, if you're it uh, from a risk perspective, somebody would say, well, if you break a leg, then, then you know, you're not going to make money next week. Mm -hmm. um, so that is challenging. It is hard to, uh, you know, uh, depending on, you know, your, your other financial circumstances to just borrow money from a bank. Um, the the some of the the obvious things to mention are things like crowdfunding. If you already have a large social media following, um, you could definitely monetize that. You there are there are people who are um, really doing very well on some of the newer social media platforms where you can send somebody small tokens of appreciation. It doesn't have to be a lot if it's coming from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So that works, but that is not for everybody. I, I recognize that as well. So um, some of the funding conversations are probably useful to have with your local economic development agency. Um, but I would also just in, 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 you know, scrappy bootstrappy lean startup style, say, start with something small. And so if there is a, a form, uh, a, a, an offering that you can, that you can have. So if there's, if you can do the smallest unit of what you're offering to your clients without expensive equipment, do that. So I'm going to say, I'm going to offer um, training sessions in a park, um, and we're just going to use what we already have. Um, so potentially, and if we need if we need dumbbells, what, I'm going to check with a local library if they have a couple of dumbbells we can borrow, and and or or from a local gym or what have you. So I'm going to try and find ways to do the first couple of things that I'm going to do very very cheaply, and make some money there to be able to reinvest some of that money um, into the next steps. Now that's. That is hard. I recognize that's hard. Um, but I also think as you build your customer base and sometimes even your fan base, honestly, people who care about you and see that you have something really amazing to offer, um, always be open to asking. Um, I, I have found that just in my personal life, telling people what I'm currently looking for mm -hmm. to be incredibly valuable. Um, the most helpful piece of advice I've ever gotten was on an airplane from New York to Boston from the person sitting next to me um, 25 years ago or so, just because I was telling them what I was looking for. So 
Um, don't underestimate getting to a point where you can crisply state, I am good at this. I am working towards doing this. Um, I think that's that's really important. Um, the, the, the role I currently have, um, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to do this. Um, and so in 2018, I traveled the country and visited incubators, places where startups can rent lab space mm -hmm. um, all across the country and told people, I want to run a wet lab based um, biomedical startup incubator. And, that, you know, it's in a couple of words. That's what I want to do. I'm not sure whether I have the qualifications and whether there is even enough of those out there. But um, by telling people what I'm looking for, I'm allowing them to help me. Hey, you should talk to X. And so if I said, I am a, a fitness professional and my hope is to do X, five, six words, not five, six sentences, five, six words. And in order to get there, this is what I'm currently looking for. That allows your neighbor, your aunt, your grandma to say, hey, I met this lady at the library or the church. You should talk to her. Or yeah, I met this gentleman at the um, whatever it is. You should talk to him. In the worst case, you have a fun conversation. In the best case, they know someone who can help you. So put your shingle out. Tell people what you're looking for. Let people help you. I, I love it. The, the statement that comes to my mind when I hear you say it is, closed mouths don't get fed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, yes. if, if, if you aren't asking, and I tell this to my students and my team and everyone I mentor, if you're not putting yourself out there and you're not asking, no one's ever going to know what you need. And like you said, the worst thing that happens is somebody says no. The second worst thing that happens is you have a, a conversation and make a friend. And the best thing that happens is you end up on a flight from New York to Boston and you get the best piece of advice you've ever gotten. It's like there's, there's very little downside, but I think that's a it, that's such a profound concept that I think a lot of people are either afraid to do or don't think they can do. But it, going back to what we talked about with the resources that are out there, resources are all around us if we're just receptive to the opportunities. Yes. We have a lot of great lessons that we talked about. And I think as we've gone, our listeners have started to understand why someone who comes from your background and is in your world is, is talking to our group of people. But I love to give our listeners something actionable to take away. So you talked about, you talked about a lot. If you were going to speak to our listeners directly and say, hey, out of everything I just said, if, if you're out there and you're, you're thinking of starting up your own business or you're in that startup mode, this is the one thing I take away from this conversation. Do you think you can distill it down to that one thing? I want to say two. Um, know your audience and ask for help. <laughs> Do I get two? <laughs> you, you, yes, you, you get two. Absolutely. Because knowing your audience is asking for help to a degree, because you're basically asking your audience for help to understand your audience. So I think, I think those are probably two sides of the same coin, but I think they are, they are critical pieces of advice. And just from my perspective as an entrepreneur, it always, it, well, it never ceases to amaze me how willing people are to help. I don't know what experience you've had with that, but in my experience, if you ask people for help, most people will help you. I couldn't agree more. And I, um, I find that initial step is really important. In my transition from scientist to business person, I went to an event and uh, shout out to a woman called Diane Darling. Her name was easy for me to remember, um, who gave a talk to a lot of women about to go to business school and said, um, networking is building a relationship when you don't need it mm. um, or before you need it. And so that's um, building relationships and, and staying in touch. And um, so I'm not really asking you for anything just yet. I'm just interested in you. And sometimes you have a need that I can easily fulfill. You told me about this thing and tomorrow I get a newsletter that is exactly about that thing. I'm going to forward that and said, hey, that made me think of you. That's it. Um, so pay it forward. But then also, because I do a ton of paying forward every day of the week, I don't feel shy about being vulnerable. So um, people get a little bit clammed up when you ask them for money directly. Mm -hmm. Hey, got $10,000 to spare? Mm -hmm. I'm building a business. That's awkward. But I'm trying you know, to build a business and um, 
I'm looking for, for opportunities to um, rent equipment or I'm looking for, for a cheap space to start or things like that. That's something where somebody can say, oh, you could talk to such and such. So I find, um, I find being a little bit vulnerable, but genuine and helpful where you can makes you more confident about asking when you can. That's great. And there's, there's two things that I want to pull out from that before we move on, because I think they're critically important lessons. One is you know, networking is developing a relationship before you need it. I think that is so critical because you, so many people get asked for so many things during the day. If your first conversation is an ask, it might work sometimes, but more often than not, that's going to be off-putting. The second thing that you said that I think is also equally as critical is the idea of just being genuinely interested in providing value to somebody else before you expect them to be interested in you and provide value in you. And I think that's such a way to trans transcend the transaction of a typical business relationship. I think that's such a good point that you made. Well, Diane, I, I can I can keep asking questions on this for hours and hours simply because I'm just trying to figure out how to fix all the mistakes that I've probably made over the years. But uh, I want to start to wrap this up. Before I get to my final question, I would like to give people some direction as to where they can go to find out more about you and all of the things you're doing. Where would be the best place to go? So I am at Innovation Partnerships at the University of Michigan. And so if you, uh, if you just Google uh, uh, University of Michigan Innovation Partnerships, I'm easy to find. There's really just one Diane Buis. Um, I am not as active as I could be on Twitter. Uh, I am definitely a LinkedIn power user because I'm a networker. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I will uh, impart my pet peeve. And that is someone I've never met reaching out to me on LinkedIn without leaving some context. If you listen to the podcast and, and say, hey, I thought you had great things to say. I'd love to stay in touch. Great. That gives me context. A network is really only worth as much as you put work into it, as its curation. So that's, uh, that's one thing I would say, but super happy to, to connect people. I think that's how we create value for all of us um, to be, being helpful to each other where we can. Outstanding. I'm very excited to ask you this last question because I always get excited to ask people questions that are outside of our industry that and quite often people in our industry are the only ones thinking about. Uh, the thesis to this podcast is that there's a disconnect between fitness and wellness professionals and medical professionals. That's the wellness paradox as I define it. From your very outsider's perspective to our industry, if you could give those fitness professionals that are listening one piece of advice as to how to maybe close off that gap, what do you think that piece of advice would be? Curious humility. Mm. And that is, um, be curious as to what the other person is about. Um, assume they have knowledge to give. And so there's, there's, there's in their hides respect, right? Humility means I show other people respect. So respect their opinion. You don't have to adopt them. Uh, be curious about what they bring to the table. Um, and, uh, and, and, you bring something to the table too. So share that. Um, and I think that's, that's the key to collaboration, understanding each other and um, seeing that in the end, we're moving towards the same goal. Many of us in, in any industry are moving towards the same goal. We just come from different paradigms and Paradigms change, <laughs> science changes, what we hold very dear, what we learned in our education can change. And so the humility to say, you know what, that has changed. Let's, let's revisit is good. So um, a curious humility, I think is a, is a good thing to live by. Curious humility. I love it. Perfect answer. Diane Boyce, thank you so much for joining us on the Wellness Paradox. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Diane as much as I did. If you found it insightful and valuable, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares really do make a difference for us. Any information we'd like to share with you from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode 44. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And if you have a moment, 
please do leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well. Thank <music> you.